Come on. I ain't gonna bite you. Come around here and let me have a look at you. Why don't you come and have a sit this time? Maybe I'll stand. I felt like sitting. I know. You're not human, are you? If I had to guess, I'd say you're a program from the machine world. But if that's true, that could mean you are part of this system. Another kind of control. I'm interested in one thing, Neil. The future. And believe me, I know. The only way to get there is to get there. Once Neo figures out that he is indeed the one prophesized to save humanity from the machines and the simulated world of the Matrix, it's fair to say that things get pretty complicated. The simple binaries established in 1999's The Matrix, which we covered a few weeks back, begin to break down. Simulation versus reality, man versus machine, and choice versus fate all get a bunch more complex. While fate in the Matrix presents itself through prophecy, notably a prophecy which appears to come true, The Matrix Reloaded holds a slightly darker position, suggesting that the fate our characters have been following all along was in fact just a form of control levied onto humanity by their machine overlords. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and is voted for by everyone in last week's poll. Today, we'll be exploring The Matrix Reloaded. Reloaded starts where The Matrix left off. Well, sort of. The first portion of the film is taken up by Neo, Trinity and Morpheus returning to Zion. In these varying scenes, we're presented with a humanity that's split. The lower echelons of society believe that Neo is a messiah, while the bureaucrats, most notably Locke, scold Morpheus and his crew, rejecting the idea of prophecy or fate. Zion is also under siege by the Sentinels, essentially war robots which are slowly drilling their way through to the last human stronghold. Despite humanity being split, they all seem to be able to agree on one thing, a big old rave where Neo and Trinity also consummate their love. But in this moment, Neo is haunted by a vision of Trinity's death and goes to find answers. You have the sight now, Neo. You are looking at the world without time. Then why can't I see what happens to her? We can never see past the choices we don't understand. Back into the Matrix, Neo meets up with the Oracle once again, who delivers much of the meat of Reloaded's questions. Neo figures out that the Oracle is in fact a computer program, not a human plugged into the Matrix, leading to his question, How can I trust you? Bad news is there's no way if you can really know whether I'm here to help you or not. So it's really up to you. Just have to make up your own damn mind to either accept what I'm going to tell you or reject it. The Oracle then goes on to explain that trust and choice is irrelevant in the world, arguing that You didn't come here to make the choice. You've already made it. So the only thing that Neo can do is to understand why the choice has been made a certain way. With this, she sets Neo on his course to go to the mainframe where rogue and error programs are sent to die. But to do so, he must utilize the services of the Keymaker, who's been held hostage by a powerful program called the Merovingian. Before Neo can leave the square, he's confronted by Agent Smith, or at least a number of them. Smith explains that their interaction at the end of the first film set him free, resulting in him being able to multiply himself like a virus within the Matrix. Smith then begins to discuss how purpose relates to fate, before using multiple copies of himself to try and defeat Neo. We are here because of you, Mr. Anderson. We're here to take from you what you tried to take from us. After escaping the clutches of Smiths, he confronts the Merovingian and buys Morpheus and Trinity time to get the Keymaker out, who explains that there is only one way to the mainframe, through a door that only he can provide the key to. But it's protected by many, many systems within the Matrix, meaning they need to destroy an entire power grid to gain access. Still haunted by the vision of Trinity's death, Neo asks her to promise that she won't come back into the Matrix. As the power station explodes, the team go to enter, but everything powers back up, forcing Trinity to plug herself into the Matrix and do her thing, before being overwhelmed by agents. You are here because Zion is about to be destroyed. It's every living inhabitant terminated, its entire existence eradicated. Bullshit. Bullshit. Neo makes it into the mainframe and meets the architect, portrayed by my old film teacher, Helmut Nikaitis, who introduces himself as the one who built the first Matrix, revealing that the Matrix that Neo is familiar with is the second version. But as the Merovingian had hinted at before, this isn't the first cycle of this Matrix, there have been five before it, each cycle consisting of the one emerging within the Matrix as a necessary anomaly in the system. Denial is the most predictable of all human responses, but rest assured. 
This will be the sixth time we have destroyed it, and we have become exceedingly efficient at it. The one would then come to the mainframe room, meet the architect, and be given a choice to either let the machines destroy the current real-world Zion, and then handpick a population of people to start a new Zion, allowing life to go on, or to effectively do nothing and let all of humanity die. Of course, the choice of every iteration so far was to choose a new population for Zion, effectively becoming the first one to wake his people up, as recounted by Morpheus in the first film, essentially making the one a prophecy to both end and save humanity as it is known in that cycle, and begin it afresh, ensuring their survival. But this time, it's different, as this is the first time that the one has felt love. And so, Neo goes back and saves Trinity by doing a Superman thing, before pulling a bullet from her heart, potentially dooming humanity as a result. What happens next is even more remarkable. The two unplug and return to the Nebuchadnezzar, which is then blown up, leaving the crew seemingly defenseless as Sentinels come in for the kill. But Neo stands strong and manages to, at least seemingly, trigger his powers in the real world, stopping the Sentinels in their tracks just as he stops bullets in the Matrix. This throws up a ton of question marks, and we're left with a cliffhanger regarding a now minor character called Bane that is possessed by Agent Smith, who seems to have triggered the EMP in the tunnels. That was quite a lot of information, but as Reloaded is a pretty dense film, it's important to lay the major events out before we dive into the themes. Throughout Neo's conversations with the Oracle and the Architect, it becomes eminently clear that the prophecy of the One is not quite what it once seemed. Instead of it being a single event that would change the world forever, it was revealed to be a recurrent anomaly of the Matrix. But more importantly, the machines learned to manage this anomaly in order to keep it contained and controlled. So the sixth iteration Neo's journey to become the One was nothing unique at all. In fact, the system in place held control over the process, knowing full well what was happening each step of the way. This totally reforms the idea of fate, changing it from the glorious idea of individual fate impacting reality, to the concept that fate is manufactured by larger powers to exert control. This ideology aligns with that of the 17th century Dutch philosopher Baruch Spinoza, who believed that a deterministic universe meant that humans were not capable of committing any acts of free will, provided that an act of free will was defined as an uncaused action. Thus, in Spinoza's philosophy, the world is predetermined by all that came before, Neo and Counselor Harmon make clear note of this when discussing how the machines which purify Zion's air and water control humanity, as if humanity were ever to switch them off, they would perish. Thus, the humans must continue to maintain these machines deterministically, with no choice. I like to be reminded this city survives because of these machines. These machines are keeping us alive while other machines are coming to kill us. However, this isn't all doom and gloom. For Spinoza, freedom amounted to accepting what had to be, and thus accepting one's purpose in the world. This word purpose is found all throughout Reloaded, most obviously from Agent Smith, who tells Neo that one needs purpose to exist. There is no escaping reason, no denying purpose, because as we both know, without purpose, we would not exist. But put into the context of the Matrix as a highly functioning machine, we can consider purpose further. We're all here to do what we're all here to do. The programs have purposes, the people have purposes as biological batteries in the real world, and the imperfections of the Matrix have purposes in allowing humans to believe that the Matrix is real. Thus, while Neo comes around as an anomaly, he's part of the grand purpose of maintaining the Matrix, and all the other iterations of the One up to this point had submitted themselves to this purpose, choosing to allow Zion to be destroyed and created anew as part of the larger system in play, where the machines not only control the Matrix, but the ebbs and flows of the real world as well. But this Neo is different. In a very storybook way, love is the force that unbalances the equilibrium of this cycle. But perhaps love is the only force capable of breaking this flow of control. Taken logically, the architect's proposition to either save humanity or doom them is a no-brainer. Everyone would choose to save humanity if it was only logic on the table. However, love throws a spanner in the works, causing Neo to risk everything because of his powerful personal emotions. In other words, love is a force that the Matrix can't control. But is that really the case? This storyline of love triumphing over everything still aligns with Spinoza's form of determinism, as from the Oracle's words in the previous film, we know that Trinity was destined to fall in love with the One, inevitably making love part of the equation. In this way, while love is causing Neo to go against the cycle which came before, this is no surprise. After all, it was the Oracle, a 
computer program within the Matrix that prophesied of the love between Neo and Trinity. So, while love appears to be an anomaly that tears apart the workings of the Matrix, it's just as likely that this love was destined to be there all along, implanted by the higher power of the machines. Consider this, if Neo chooses to allow Zion to be destroyed, are there any negatives for the machines? Not really. There are levels of survival we are prepared to accept. When Neo puts up his hands and successfully destroys a bunch of sentinels within the real world, everything we have known is thrown into disarray. There are two clear options for what happened. Either A, Neo's powers have transcended the Matrix and now exist within the real world, or B, what we have known as the real world is actually just another layer of simulation. Although we might immediately question why a simulation would look like this, a grim, dark, scary, and more or less hopeless world, we have to ask whether that is really any more far-fetched than a simulation being near perfect. After all, the architect did say to Neo that the first version of the Matrix was rejected on the grounds that it was too perfect, so if a simulation were this horrific, would people reject it? Perhaps not. While Neo's power suggests a potential simulation within a simulation, so too does the character Bane, Early in the film, we see Bane get possessed by Agent Smith, turning into a Smith duplicate. However, it later comes to our attention, mainly in the next film, that after unplugging from the Matrix, the real-world Bane in Zion has also become possessed by Agent Smith. Now, as Smith is a computer program, it's hard to conceive of him ever existing outside of the digital world, suggesting that perhaps the real world which contains Zion could be another layer of the simulation. An idea like this, of the real world in fact not being real, doubles the ideas of a simulation which we covered in the previous video on the Matrix, creating another layer in Plato's cave. However, perhaps the philosophy that ties most to this is Descartes. Descartes discusses how dreams, when we are in them, convince us that they are real through their lifelike sensations and events, and it's not until we wake up from them that we realise their falsehood. This led Descartes to question whether the reality we live in could be taken at face value, as it could just be another example of our perception tricking us into believing in a false reality. In such a way, it's not hard to conceive that the real world of Zion is also a simulation. This link to dreaming is even hinted at as the Nebuchadnezzar is blown up, and Morpheus says the line from the biblical king Nebuchadnezzar, I have dreamed a dream. But nothing. Whether Zion is another simulation or not, the big message behind The Matrix Reloaded is that of structural control. Throughout the film, it becomes clear that Neo being the one, as well as the existence of Zion and the freeing of people from The Matrix, are all events that are under complete control of the machines. This leads towards a shift in the film's philosophy, away from questions of fate, towards the Spinozan idea of accepting one's fate and finding purpose within that. In other words, the questions go from a decisive black and white to a wash of grey, and what is most terrifying is that this wash of grey most resembles the real world we live in. The systems beyond our control and our comprehension, including governments, global politics, international conflicts, and consumer control, among others, all strongly reflect how we fall into place as individuals in the societies and world within which we're born. While this might sound grim, Reloaded does give us some hope that perhaps love can be a force of change that pulls us away from the status quo of control. 